Hello, and welcome to our webinar, New and Notable Nonfiction Picture Books from Random House Children's Books. I'm Sarah Hunter, editor of the Books for Youth and Graphic Novels sections at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question for today's panelists during the discussion or need any technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and any questions we do not get during the Q&A, we will pass along to our panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the captions icon on the toolbar mentioned earlier. From there, you can select show or hide captions from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle setting. If you have any trouble, please contact us at webinars at booklistonline.com. And finally, Booklist expects all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates the standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may at the discretion of the organizers be immediately removed. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Charnel Pinkney Barbell, author of Little Rosetta and the Talking Guitar, Rachel Ignatowski, author of What's Inside a Caterpillar Cocoon, Liz Montague, author of Jackie Ormas Draws the Future, and Melissa Stewart, author of Whale Fall. We will kick things off today with Charnel Pinky Barlow. Charnel received her BFA in illustration from the University of the Arts Philadelphia and her MFA in, the, in illustration as visual essay program for the School of Visual Arts in New York. Charnel's children's books include Everything in Its Place, The Real Santa, and Remember to Dream a Berry. Charnel lives in Indianapolis with her husband. When she's not drawing, she is baking, sewing, or reading with a cup of tea by her side. Find her online at callmechartreuse.com and follow her on Instagram at callmechartreuse. Thank you for being here, Charnel. Thank you. Um, so Little Rosetta and the Talking Guitar um, is a story of Sister Rosetta Tharp. Uh, she's the woman who invented rock and roll, um, and she was known for a very a uh, unique finger picking style, so much so that people said that she could make her guitar talk. Um, so Little Rosetta and the Talking Guitar is about her journey of learning the guitar. A lot of people don't know that she mastered the acoustic guitar by age six. So um, that is what this story is about. It's her journey of getting her first guitar and, and mastering it and making that guitar talk. Thank you, Charnel. Up next, we'll hear from Rachel Ignatowski. Rachel is the author and illustrator of many nonfiction books, including the New York Times bestseller, Women in Science and the Wondrous Workings of Planet Earth. Rachel grew up in New Jersey on a healthy diet of cartoons and pudding. After graduating from Tyler School of Art and Architecture, she began creating illustrations that make learning exciting. Rachel hopes this book will inspire your kids to ask questions about their world and to explore science and nature. For more, visit her at rachelignatowskidesign.com. Take it away, Rachel. Hey, everybody. Um, so this book is part of my What's Inside series that explores the biology in your own backyard and answers the small questions that kids have about science and nature. And this book is all about the journey that caterpillars make when they uh, transform into a moth or a butterfly. So we actually compare and contrast moths and butterflies throughout the book. And we talk about this little insect's journey and also why it's important. Why should we take care of our planet and creatures big and small, help our environment, help our ecosystems. And what's so cool about this book is that it aligns perfectly with what is being taught in elementary school core curriculum, which makes it a tool that teachers can use in classrooms um, all throughout elementary school, whether it's just the story time circle that they're doing or even teaching a full in-depth science lesson, all with beautiful illustrations that really dive into the science, but also make these caterpillars look like little friends that you're going to learn with. So I'm really excited about this book. Thank you, Rachel. 
Now we'll hear from Liz Montague. Liz is a cartoonist, writer, and illustrator whose work focuses on the intersection of self and social awareness. She began contributing cartoons to The New Yorker in 2019 and has illustrated for the US Open, Food Network, Google, and the Joe Biden Presidential Group. She's been profiled by the Washington Post, ABC News, and today on their media outlet. Liz is the creator of the popular Liz at Large cartoon series, which previously ran in Washington City Paper and is passionate about documenting social change and protest movements. Her first book for children, the graphic memoir, Navy and Artist, was published in October, 2022. The floor is yours, Liz. Hi, everybody. Um, so this is my book, Jackie Orms Draws the Future. It's about cartoonist Jackie Orms. Uh, she's considered the first kind of black woman cartoonist to have a syndicated strip in America. Um, and the book is really about her childhood and her journey into becoming an artist. Uh, it's geared towards younger readers and I got to make very fun, bright art. You can see some of my process here from sketch to final art. And I really just wanted to take readers along on the journey of her life uh, and how she became who she was. Uh, and to really just put her on the map for maybe some younger readers or anybody who wants to read a picture book who maybe didn't know who she was. She's kind of unfairly obscure, uh, in my opinion, at least. And this was so much fun to make. Thank you so much, Liz. Finally, we'll hear from Melissa Stewart. Melissa has written more than 200 science books for children, including Tree Hole Homes, Daytime Dens, and Nighttime Notes, the ALA notable book Feathers Not Just for Flying, and the SCBWI Golden Kite Honor Title Pipsqueaks, Slowpokes, and Stinkers, Celebrating Animal Underdogs. She co authored five kinds of nonfiction, enriching reading and writing instruction with children's books, and edited the anthology Nonfiction Writers Dig, 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 Dig Deep. 50 award-winning authors reveal the secret of engaging writing. Melissa maintains the award-winning blog Celebrate Science and serves on the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators Board of Advisors. Take it away, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Sarah. Um, so Whale Fall takes readers on an incredible, incredible journey to the bottom of the ocean to discover what happens when a whale dies. So after a 70-year-long 70 70 long life, a whale sinks to the bottom of the ocean floor and be and is a an ecosystem. It creates this ecosystem for a community of creatures that can come and feed on it. So there are hundreds of species, millions of individual animals that come and feed on it for at least 50 years, sometimes more. And they have incredible names like uh, zombie worms and snub nose eel pouts and um, sea pigs. So I think kids will really enjoy getting to know this world and exploring an ecosystem that most people never have an opportunity to visit in their lifetimes. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, I'm now going to invite all the authors to turn on their cameras for our q and I'm gonna turn on mine too, to be fair. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to talk about picture book nonfiction today because it's one of my like secret loves. Um, I, I really think that it's fascinating to talk about and fascinating to read. So I'm excited to talk to all of you about it. Um, so you've each covered, we've got like a wide array of uh, nonfiction topics here, but what you all have in common is distilling complex topics down to the level that a young reader um, can appreciate. So I'm wondering how you each approach distilling those topics for your audience. Um, so right now, why don't we start with you on this one, if that's okay? Yeah, so what I tried to do um, with Little Rosetta was to kind of pick like one like key aspect that I wanted to, to show kids um, and then kind of building off of that. So I really tried to focus on the sounds she was hearing, like just throughout the community, because um, at the time there was, you know, no internet, there's no, no TV. So it's like, okay, so how is this little girl hearing sounds to create this music? Um, and also showing uh, that brings in the community aspect as well, um, which I think was really important um, for her. Um, and, you know, kind of carrying that through, through the entire manuscript. Cool. Rachel, can we go to you next with this question? Oh yeah. Um, well, I have a graphic design background, so I kind of lean on my skills of organizing typography in different ways to really 
talk about really complicated topics. So I've written a lot of books at the eighth grade level that can age down all the way to like 10 to adult. But these elementary school books that I'm making with Random House Kids, starting with my What's Inside a Flower for my What's Inside series, now with What's Inside a Caterpillar's Cocoon, I try to age it where it goes from pre-K all the way to fifth. And I do that by sort of layering the information in and weaving it into the illustration. So there's the, uh, you know, the set copy that you're going to read aloud, but then in the illustration, there's all these fun facts and asides and little um, arrows pointing uh, to vocab that uh, the reader can really grow with. So you, you can take a simple journey or you could spend e more time on each page and take a, a sort of like almost an I spy with the information and really, really soak it all in. So that's how readers can grow with it. So, yeah. How about you? How do you approach this selling a uh, topic down? Me? Yeah. Oh. Um, so I really wanted uh, kids to be able to see themselves in Jackie, which is why at the beginning of the book, it's her as like a very young girl and it kind of follows, you know, her life as she grows up. Um, and really, I also have a background in graphic design. And so I did really, <laughs> I really, uh, leaned into making, uh, really fun compositions with really bright colors. So maybe if it is like a very, very young reader, maybe it's just the bright colors that are maybe like catching their attention now. And then maybe later on, or like as they grow up, they're able to kind of like revisit it and actually sit with the words and sit with her story. Um, and I just tried to be as succinct as possible and communicate the information in the most efficient way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that um, It felt like, okay, like this is just, a person's story as they grow up and I'm a person who's going to grow up one day. At least that's my hope for kids. <laughs> and Melissa, how about you? How do, how do you approach the story concepts like this? Yeah, that's a great question. I think usually when I'm starting out with a book, the first thing that I think about is the text structure. Mm -hmm. And since I usually write expository nonfiction, there are a lot of different choices that I can choose from. But with Whalefall, I was really lucky because it's a process that happens over a period of time, it had that built in sequence text structure that I could just really take advantage of. So I knew that from the very beginning that I really wanted to focus on the circle of life aspect. And so I knew what that text structure was gonna be right away. And that freed me up to really spend more time to think carefully about the specific language that I was choosing, how much vocabulary I was going to include. If I was going to use complex words, how was I going to um, use text scaffolding to make sure that readers could acclimate to that information to kind of build an understanding step-by-step -step over time, you know, from one sentence to a next, to make sure that they felt comfortable with some of those longer words that are in the book. So that's how I approached it. Thanks. Um, so uh, Charnel and Liz, you both have written biographies. Um, and I'm curious about whether there's anything particularly challenging about writing biographies specifically for young readers. Um, and alternatively, what has been the most rewarding thing about the process of, write, reward, of writing a biography for young readers? Um, Liz, can we start with you on this one? Sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, the most challenging thing is that for me, at least it was a whole person's life. Mm -hmm. And that was like very daunting of how do I condense this into, you know, to like 20 spreads? Um, because it's like, you want to be fair to them and you know that life is complex and long and layered. Mm -hmm. And how do I make this into something that is succinct and flowing and life isn't always succinct and flowing? Um so that was really intimidating. And I had to like draw, I had to like write out all these timelines and then be like, okay, this is the information that I can keep. This is the information that I can't. And kind of deciding like what's important and what's not in someone else's life made me like have like a, a, a small existential crisis, but like I got over it. So. <laughs> um, and, uh, but the most rewarding part I think was I got to talk to a lot of Jackie's family, um, a lot of her mm. nieces and nephews who are still around. Um, and just how excited they were that like her story was being told and how like a new generation was kind of going to be aware of her and her work because she loved her work so much. And then also towards the end of her life, she made dolls for kids. So it's like the fact that she was creating work for kids and now like hopefully kids will be more aware of her 
it felt very like full circle. Cool. I know you're you're nodding in agreement for a lot. <laughs> well, I I definitely agree with like everything Liz was saying because it's like you know there's this this big personality you have there's so much you can write about and so like my challenge for a little Rosetta and talking guitar was that um a like sister Rosetta Tharp was a huge personality like she loved to like dress up and wear sparkles and glitter and wigs um but also we really have no written you know accounts of her as a child um like we just know a few details here and there where she was born um, that she, you know, sang, um, that she learned the guitar, that she, um, you know, had a really close relationship with her mother. Um, and so the challenge for me was to fill in the gaps mm -hmm. um, and to, you know, imagine like, okay, she started learning the guitar at four. I don't know what you guys were doing at four, but at four, I was, I was not learning the guitar. Um, and then she mastered it by age six. So I'm like, okay, trying to fill in the gaps of what was she feeling? What was she hearing? You know, um, and kind of building the story that way. Um, and then the most rewarding part would be uh, sharing a story that hasn't been told. Uh, because, I mean, it was something that wasn't really talked about. So when I looked her up and I saw that, I was like, okay, why is, like, I've never heard this before. A six-year-old <laughs> mastering the guitar um so I think that when kids read it like it'll make them want to like jump up and be like yeah let me go you know do something like I can do anything um especially you know at such a young age there's so much that kids can do I'm, I'm really curious about the, the fact that there's so little information about her childhood like what did you do to extrapolate a story from that like did you look at like other information about you know the region where she lived or the time period it's such a it seems like such a big puzzle to fill in. Yeah, so I first looked at um, some biographies that were written on her. Um, I looked at a lot of news articles. Um, mm -hmm. She was born in Cotton Plant, Arkansas, um, I believe in 1920, 1920? <laughs> I believe so. Um, and so at that time, like I, you know, researched that area. I researched what was around there. Um, mm -hmm. It was a small segregated community, um, so there wasn't really much around. Uh, her and her mom were really involved in the church at that time, um, so I kind of used that and built it from there, just mm -hmm. with like, what was the community like, what, you know, what sounds could she have heard, like, you know, people were still using wagons at that time, so I mentioned, you know, the squeak of like the wagon wheels. Um, and like the trains, you know, kind of mm -hmm. grumbling down the tracks and stuff like that. So, cool. Um, Rachel and Melissa, I'm going to turn over to you here. Um, you both uh, are working in illustration, obviously, everybody here is, but I'm curious about um, the importance of illustration specifically for books about biological sciences for children. Um, Rachel, I think that yours in particular does a lot of like they look like diagrams albeit with smiley faces um but melissa yours too um you have that fascinating back map with all the little drawings of the creatures that you see i wonder um if you could each speak to why it's important for books about biology for children should have pictures and melissa why don't we start with you on this Sure. So I think so. I'm not the illustrator of of Whalefall. Rob Dunlavius, but um, I'm very lucky. He actually lives about 20 minutes away from me, and we've been doing book events together. So I actually I know how he would answer that question, and I sort of know how I would answer this question because it has come up several times. I think, especially um, for science in general, but especially for this topic. The illustrations are critical because it's a place that no one, almost no one has ever been to before. Mm -hmm. And certainly the readers have never been to before. And although you can go online and see videos of this place, they really, they won't show all the animals. They'll just show the environment for a few minutes. And so if you want to get kind of an overall feel of the entire thing, having a series of, of 20 or so paintings that shows it is really critical and it can show all the different stages 
like you were saying, in the back matter, we also show all the, the animals up close so you can really get a good look at them and have some um, specific facts about them, the size, um, how long they live, all those kinds of things. And I think that by having, by showing the entire process, it allows you to see what's happening, at what stage um, are, are they eating the meat and the flesh off the whale? When are, how, what is the process that the bones use to break down over time? What are the creatures that feed on it at specific points in that, at the, in that cycle? And what are the creatures that are feeding on the animals that are feeding on the whale directly? And so it really, it is a vibrant way of bringing the ecosystem to life. And one of the things that I really love about these illustrations, so we talked um, about the style of the, the paintings and they're really, they're really kind of, Rob's style is really kind of this almost impressionistic mm -hmm. kind of view and it really, softens it. And I think one of the things that we really wanted to do, as, as Rob says, he's like, uh, Melissa broke the number one rule of writing. She killed the main character on page one. <laughs> and it's true. Um, and because that, because there is a death of a beloved animal early on, I thought it was really important to have kind of a gentle, reverent tone to the entire book. And I think that the illustrations really convey that mood very strongly. I've, I've seen that clip from Blue Planet where they um, they film the, the, I think it's the lampreys eating the, or there are some sharks that eat one of the whales that has fallen. Yeah. And it is genuinely horrifying to watch. So I appreciated <laughs> the softened, impressionistic, like mysterious, shadowy artwork in the book. It definitely took away some of the, the gruesomeness of what's actually going on if you're looking at it realistically. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think it's just one of those things that I, it it's it makes you feel so many things all at once mm -hmm. because it's sad and it's tragic and it's a little bit grotesque, but it's also fascinating. And these are animals that you've never seen, that you never even knew of existed, and that exist nowhere else on the planet Earth except at these one at this one very specific ecosystem. Um, so we we really in the words and in the in the art we were trying to convey all those things simultaneously. Cool, um, Rachel, your book takes a, like the opposite approach, which is putting <laughs> little happy faces on all of the insects. <laughs> so, <laughs> can you talk yeah. a little bit about um, why illustration is so important to you and your work? Well, you know, when I was a little kid. I actually struggled a ton with reading mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't really get a hold of reading, like really grasp it until I would say about third grade. Um, so, but the thing that really kind of like helped me gain confidence, but also made me love books were these overly illustrated uh, nonfiction books cartoons and comic books, stuff that had a ton of illustration. I remember the feeling of, of kind of being down on myself for not really getting reading right away. And I remember the shift of feeling like, hey, I'm a smart kid. I just need to, I, I just need a lot of illustrations. I need to approach everything I learn with illustrations. So not only is illustration a very powerful tool when it comes to grasping new concepts and being a tool for uh, education, but it's also, I believe, a confidence builder for topics that can kind of seem scary. And for a lot of people, and I would say for a lot of adults, learning new science is one of the most scary things that you know, someone can do. And I think that illustration kind of punches a, a hole through that and kind of um, allows uh, new readers to learn new things. And, and what's better than a smiley face to <laughs> kind of like hold your hand in it? I also think, and I just, I have a little cover right here because I just want to show this gold foil. There's something that is just like, when you take the time to make something really beautiful it kind of like cuts through everybody's uh preconceptions of what a topic is supposed to feel like oh science is boring but when something is beautiful and also like you took the time to organize it so it's easy to read and then there's like 
happy little characters to kind of <laughs> hold your hand throughout to show you how you should feel. Um, all of a sudden you could reach a new reader and and then they gain the confidence to read those thick, thick textbooks. Yeah. Also, it just occurred to me that like the the place where the most detailed scientific information in your book is, is in the artwork, not in the words. Mm. Well, I did that specifically mm -hmm. for um, the the elementary school reader. So mm -hmm. um, it's kind of interesting. In my middle grade books, I kind of go uh, the opposite, where I go um, uh, the most complicated text is in the set typography. And then the fun facts are kind of like the fun things that the little littles can read. But in mm -hmm. my elementary school books, I flip it. <laughs> the 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 most simple parts are the parts that are like that you read aloud and then the more complicated texts are exploratory and kind of as you could see are set smaller um mm -hmm. so it kind of um it guides the reader into what should be read aloud in circle time but it also allows that exploration and almost like where's waldo approach with some of the information cool um Okay, Sharon, I only have a question just for you this time. Okay. So uh, music is obviously very central to um, your book. And I'm curious about how you went about capturing the music and its power in your art. Specifically. Yeah. Um, so first, uh, she was born in 1915. Apologies. I always switch it with her birth date, which is March 20th. And <laughs> I like, anyway. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, music is, you know, the, the star of the show in, in this book. Um, so what I did with the artwork was I really tried to show like the flow of of the music that's present. So using like the music notes, using the um, the ripped um, sheet music, um, a lot of which has like little like guitar chords on it. I found some that has um, all that stuff when I was like, oh, that's so cool. Instead of like piano sheet music and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the beginning of the book, when she's first learning the guitar and her mom gives her um, her first guitar and she's, you know, kind of plucking the strings and it's kind of like, you know, awkward and, and strange and new. Um, you'll notice that like the music is kind of, you know, wonky and, and uh, choppy. Um, and then as she gains more confidence, it starts to kind of flow and swirl um, a lot more. So that I had a lot of fun with with focusing on the music in this one. I like also that in some of the sheet music that you incorporated into the collage are like little pencil marks. You know, like yeah, that. I found so what I did was I went on to Etsy and I just typed in like vintage sheet music. And so <laughs> I got sent this package of like 75 different pages. It was just a bunch of random pages. And I just, you know, flipped through it. I'm like, okay, no, 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 yes. <laughs> and so there was one that it looked like um like a student had used and they kind of marked with like pencil and stuff. I was like, this is perfect. Yeah, that's so cool. That's such a nice little detail. Mm -hmm. Um, Liz, I'm curious too about how um uh, Jackie's work as a journalist and a cartoonist affected how you approach the art style for your book. Did you think about the work that she was doing in her cartoons when you were making your own art for the book? Oh yeah, a ton. Um, because like I was trying to figure out how to show her artwork without directly having to like copy her work. Cause obviously like I want to direct readers to go and investigate for themselves what her work looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I was thinking about, okay, how am I going to approach this? I tried to make it my take on her style, but have it clearly be my style, but not her style. <laughs> It was a it was an adventure to kind of walk that line though, because I draw her life basically in the style that she draw that she drew her cartoons. And then within the book, I draw her work um in like it's kind of like a grayscale so that it's set in contrast to like her very colorful life. When reality is like, you know, kind of backwards where her colorful life influenced the colorful car cartoons. Um, so I kind of wanted them to be like in conversation with each other for sure. Uh, and then her color palettes were super inspiring for me. Um, mm -hmm. I was looking up like a lot of her work. I mean, now it's like, it looks like vintage mm -hmm. now, like with our technology and everything, the colors seem kind of sepia toned and muted. And I really just brightened them up a lot. Um, but yeah, even like her lines, like her lines are very, a lot thicker than how I would normally draw. Um, they're very like curved, precise very it's very Jackie style 
And I was, I was, it was a lot of fun to do. It was different for, than how I normally draw, but mm-hmm. it's also like, oh my gosh, like she would obviously be way, way better at drawing her style than I would. So then being okay with, this is just my interpretation of her, if that makes sense. Can you talk about how you learned about her color palette? That sounds fascinating. Oh, I just, I looked up a bunch of her um, old cartoons. I mean, similar to uh, with um, Rosetta, I, I, it was really hard for me to find information about Jackie. There's only like one book about her. Um, mm-hmm. That's more of an academic text by um, Nancy Goldstein. And like trying to find clips of her work that isn't com- completely deteriorated, trying to find things that are still true to color was really, really hard. Um, prior to doing this picture book, I had actually done a Google doodle about Jackie Orms back in September of 2021, maybe 2020. Um, so I was already really familiar with her work, but then trying to get the colors exactly right. I like was printing things out. I was like tracking down books and I was like, okay, if this is how it looked 50 years ago, then I could assume that maybe now with the pigmentation degradation, and then some of it's just like, okay, this is what I think will look really good on the page and what kids will look. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a little bit of both yeah cool neat yeah that's, that's that the graphic design like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's what I was thinking about with like these old cart like newspaper cartoon strips they weren't meant to be archival like those nope. those colors uh-uh. were not made to last not um, at all and they were not like well stored at all mm-hmm. <laughs> um so Rachel uh this is also sort of pertinent. Um, the text of your book, as I mentioned before, is very concise, but the artwork is jam-packed with information, as we have said. And I'm really curious about where you, how you landed on the ratio between information in the pictures and information in the text. Well, when I'm doing all of the work, it's kind of like um, I do it all at once. Mm-hmm. So my manuscript is, you know, it's not just me writing on um, a piece of paper, like writing in Word document. It's actually me um, really transforming um, my black and white sketches where I put set copy right into it directly. Mm -hmm. So I'm setting the copy, doing the layout as I'm writing the book and and the organization of information um, is a big part about this it's just as important to the storytelling as the illustration is, as the set copy is. So um, it's all done at once. And that's really how the ratio comes down. And I, I'm just a maximalist at <laughs> heart. And that's really like the biggest part of it is that I am trying, you're talking about like a ratio, like how do you figure it out? I, I'm just trying to get as much on the page as possible. That's how I figure it out. <laughs> uh, like, and I, and I push it. And then my editor's like, you know, this is a lot. And I'm like, okay, okay. And then I cut, 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 cut. So I always do too much. And then I bring it in. Um, so Melissa, as, as I mentioned in your bio, you've written like literally hundreds of books for children about science. I'm curious about what drew you to this particular topic of all the topics that you've written about. Yeah, I think this particular topic actually came to me through another book that I had written. So I wrote um, in 2020, 2020, I had a book came out called Ick, Delightfully Disgusting Animal Dinners, Dwellings and Defenses. That is quite a title. (laughs) And um, one of the animals that I learned about when I was writing this book was the zombie worm. Mm -hmm. And there's about room for about 400 words on each spread of this book. Each spread is a different creature. And I just had so much more that I wanted to say about zombie worms. And also I realized that they were part of, zombie worms are cool, but they are part of this amazing ecosystem that is even cooler. And I really wanted to spend some time exploring and learning about that ecosystem and sharing it with with kids, with other, with other people. And so that's why I decided to do a book on it. Cool. Um, it, I love how working on a project just leads you down the path to more projects later. I think that's really gratifying. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times it's just kind of one thing flows to another, flows to another, flows to another. There's so much to learn about the world, right? So many yeah. amazing things. Yeah. Um, So we have a couple of questions from the audience that I'd like to share with you. Um, So uh, one of our audience members asks, do you find researching some topics more challenging than others? Um, And how do you go about researching those challenging topics? 
Um, oh, <laughs> I'll give you a second to think about it because you've gotten all the other questions in advance. Mute a little, little bit. Um, I'm actually, I can just jump right in on this one because yeah, it kind yeah. of just leaves off where I was before. So for this book, this was a very difficult book to research because, for example, I couldn't go to that ecosystem and there has not been that much written about it at all. I read all the scientific papers that had been written on whale falls, um, but scientists have, even though there are you know, 70,000 whales that die per year, the ocean is vast. And so the chances of finding a particular whale fall are very small. They found the, that they found the first one in 1987. And mm -hmm. since then they've only found 20 natural whale falls. So, mm -hmm. It, what was critical in this book was actually reaching out and talking to scientists who had been to the ecosystem, who were studying the ecosystem, who were, that were completely immersed in these different creatures. And that's where it came in really handy that I was writing this in the middle of the pandemic, because although the marine biologists could not go out to sea, they were stuck at home during lockdown. And so I think that if I hadn't been trying to write this book in 2020, I, I may not have been able to write it at all. I may not have been able to, to um, have them participate in the way that they did, or it certainly would have taken me much longer. It would have been a more drown out process. So I'm very grateful to those researchers and all the assistance that they gave me with, and all the information they provided that allowed me to write this book. Anybody else want to volunteer to go ahead? Sure. I mean, I've written a lot of books about a lot of different things. Um, uh, I, I, you know, uh, I've done a whole series on women's history, like Women in Science was one of my first books, then Women in Art, Women in Sports. And I think um, the other people who are working on biographies can really relate to this. Uh, I mean, to find information on people who were not um, well recorded during the time of their life it means that you have to dig through obituaries, you have to find primary sources. Um, it could get really hard. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, on the opposite end, I've written a book called The History of the Computer, which had, it's like piles and piles of information about yeah. computer history, one of the most well-documented um, histories, uh, just because it's like almost like business history and everyone's keeping documentation of it. So that was like also a challenge because then you have these like literally like you're reading like, you know, really obscure, um, like, like history about quarter four of like the browser wars in 1994. And like, you're just kind of like, who cares about, like, does anyone really want to know this much about Netscape Navigator? I don't know. And then, and then you write like a five paragraph essay about Netscape Navigator. That's never going to see the light of day. So then there's like that, there's that side of it as well. Um, but what has been really rewarding with these what's inside books, um, what's inside a flower, what's inside a caterpillar cocoon, which is the one we're talking about today is that, um, for those books, the primary source is literally the natural world I can go and explore. So I've been lucky enough to live right next to a um, uh, a monarch butterfly sanctuary for their migration. Um, mm -hmm. So I got to visit that several times during the migration. And then guess what? I'm a part of that migration too, because I live so close by. So in my front yard, all of a sudden, like an army of little monarch caterpillars are coming and they're crawling all over me. I'm um, I'm hanging out with them and we're having a good time. And I'm just like, this is like an omen that this book is just so sometimes things can get a little easy too. <laughs> that's, that's kind of primary source research, isn't it? Oh yeah. Not yeah. Falling on your finger. <laughs> I know, I know. So you ask me why do I put so many happy faces on it? It's because that's what I imagine when I'm hanging out with these caterpillars. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of piggyback off of what, you know, Rachel was mentioning. Um, it re really does depend how obscure um, the topic is, is going to give you how challenging or how less challenging it'll be. Um, and of course, there's challenges with both ends of the spectrum, right? Like if you have too much information, it's like, okay, where do I start? What do I need? What do I not need? Um, and in that case, I would just say to kind of figure out what you're trying to tell, like what story you're trying to tell, and then picking and choosing from there. Um, with, you know, with Sister Rosetta, the challenge was there's 
her childhood was very obscure. Um, but I was very grateful and very thankful that with YouTube, I got to watch, you know, her sing and her play the guitar um, on so many different occasions. And so that kind of helped me with, okay, well, how does she move? Um, how does she sound? Uh, what's her, you know, personality like? Um, and so that was very helpful. So definitely look at different sources, you know, not only written, but see what you can find on, on YouTube and the interwebs. <laughs> uh yeah having the obscure subject matters is a is definitely an adventure um because I really only had the one text by Nancy Goldstein to go off and go off of and then whatever I could like scrounge up on the internet but what I found really helpful was that a lot of Jackie's work was kind of semi-autobiographical so I was able to look back at her cartoons and at least be like okay like these were her thoughts and these were you know some of this stuff pulls from her life and having done like seen a little bit of, of information about her that was available being able to be like okay like she's pulling on her rural upbringing and like being from Pennsylvania and and just like the migration of of her life and it was really like cool to get to see that because as a cartoonist you know I have this belief that you know everything is a thinly veiled self-portrait uh just like <laughs> most work so it was cool to get to to try to like synthesize that and you mentioned also that you got a chance to talk to some of her relatives. Yeah, her well, so she had a sister who's like passed away. A lot of people who were like her contemporaries passed away already, but a lot of their kids are still around. So I've been like sending emails. They have like really fun email addresses. Um, <laughs> yeah, and they were like all really nice and just so excited about the project. So excited to get to like kind of be involved and like have me ask questions. We got some pictures from them that we got to include in the back of the book um, that like hadn't been published before. And yeah, like their cooperation was like meant the world to me. That's awesome. Did you get to go to like any cool like archives or like special collections libraries to see? No, nope. nobody like, so <laughs> what's frustrating to me is that like, um, so they, the rights to her like life and work were sold like a long time ago. Like someone mm -hmm. random like owns the copyright to all of it, but there is no like huge archive of her work like and there there should be she should be like Stan Lee she should be like all of these other artists that we know she really should be and she's had such an influence on art and cartooning and her style and we see a lot of it today and how work is done um and she was a part of founding a um a museum in Chicago and they have like some of her work but it's it's copies you know because like mm -hmm. we're talking about those newspaper materials aren't really made to be archival and they disintegrate very quickly so yeah, frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've been talking about research here, and I know in the process of writing books, having talking, having spoken to many authors, that there's so much that you just have to like leave out when you're writing a book like this. So I'm curious about what your favorite thing you discovered while researching your book that you could not include on the page. Um, Melissa, can we start with you on this one? What's you, your favorite thing you learned that you couldn't include in the book? You know, it's not so much any one thing that I learned, but one of the things that I tried to keep out of the manuscript was a lot of numbers. There mm -hmm. were so many numbers that I could have included and think they sort of add to the fascination of these creatures. Um, so exa for example, what exactly were their sizes? What were their scale in relation to each other? What year were whale falls first discovered? How much does a whale weigh? Uh, you know, a typical whale way. And, but luckily, all that information is in the back matter. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the information that I wish I could get in there, we have in the back matter. And I think that's the exciting thing about back matter. We're seeing more and more back matter in books all the time. And it, it's sort of, I love what Rachel is saying about how she tries to cram in as much as she can. I sort of feel that's what the back matter was like in my book, I'm like, okay, how many pages can I have? And how much information can I cram into each one of those pages so that they're just so rich and full of information for readers? When I was working on my questions to send to you last week, one of the ones I had that I scrapped was, can we talk about how great back matter is? But maybe I should- It's so great. <laughs> so great. Um, Rachel, how about you? Tell me about something fascinating you learned that you couldn't include in the book. Oh man, I mean, there's so much. I'm like blanking on the name of this of this moth right now. I'm I really am. I like tried to look it up real quick. Well, <laughs> there's this like okay, so there's this like one caterpillar who um, when they build 
their cocoon and it, it's a moth um it it uh basically like kind of like creates a little house so you you see the little the little dude and he's crawling around with little tiny sticks on his back and he collects the tiny sticks until he creates his his like beautiful complicated weaving that he then you know sheds his skin is like i'm a pupa and so I, I i i wanted to go deeper into that instead i just drew the cocoon in the in the book um and another thing that i really wanted to talk about that i didn't have space to because you also have to remember like when you're writing a book you have to kind of like especially nonfiction even if it's for kids, there still is a thesis and you don't want to go off thesis too, too much. So um, in the book, I talk about monarchs, but it's not a book about monarchs. But as I was writing this book, um, the numbers came in about just how much my like monarch butterfly loss there's been in the past couple of years and how they're now on the endangered species list. Oh and although I didn't get to talk about that in depth for this book, I definitely use that good old back matter to drive <laughs> home the point that like, these are the things that you can be doing in the organizations that you can support to help like protect, you know, not only insect species, but the planet in general. So although I don't get to go in depth about how the monarchs have become endangered so rapidly, so um, like, like soon to, you know, it publishing, um, it is something that we talk about the solutions to that problem in the book. Liz, can you go next? Yeah. Um, something <laughs> interesting that I found was that uh, Jackie, because she did work kind of about, not kind of, she did work about race and about like the things that were happening at the time she was on like an fbi watch list and i didn't know how to situate that within the narrative without being like mccarthyism and all of it. like and i didn't know how to create that in a narrative for for young kids so that was something that didn't make it but you know the the spirit of it is there though in the in the work that she did mm -hmm. yeah i i read that in a in a book because there there have been a few books on her uh, about her recently and I read that in another one and I was like, whoa, she was just a cartoonist. <laughs> but nobody's ever really just a cartoonist. Artist, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Charnel, um, what's your favorite thing you learned that couldn't make it in the book? Um, so I would say the fact that um, little Rosetta's mom had a like a traveling um, evangelical like musical troupe that they would just like go to different cities and perform and um, Rosetta would perform with them and stuff. Uh, and so that was something that I was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. But it just, it wasn't really, I couldn't fit it into the manuscript, but it mm -hmm. is in the back matter. So. <laughs> back matter, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know <laughs> what I would do without back matter. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> Well, you answered my how great is back matter question anyway, so <laughs> I don't know that I it. <laughs> um, we have another question from the audience. Um, they're wondering how long it takes you from idea to publication of a book when you're working on a project. I think it depends on the book. Yeah. Um, I mean, these books uh, that I do, it's like a half year. Mm -hmm. So two books a year um for the what's inside um and then the the books that are longer that are twice as long take about a year um the history of the computer uh that book which is like that was like a monumental task because like that book an illustrated book about computer history really didn't exist before and it spans twenty five thousand years of human history uh that took three years from the research to the like last thing handed in to go to the printer so that was um that was a lot um <laughs> Melissa how about you you've got quite a a prolific backlist how much time do you spend on books uh it, it, as Rachel was saying it really depends on the book and it, so for for this book it actually takes me longer considering kind of the whole process and maybe this is because Rachel is um, sort of doing both things at once, whereas I have, a, it's a whole separate step for the illustrator. That might be a reason that it, it takes longer. Um, so for for this book, this book took about four years, the fall, but 
that's sort of that's short of short for me. If you look in the background, you can see I had a book that came out um, six months ago from Random House Studio, also Tree Hole Homes, and that book took an astonishing eleven years from the time I had the idea until the time it was ultimately published. And it's because it just took me. You know, sometimes it's it's very difficult, even with the magic of Google. Sometimes finding specific things is very difficult, and they and I just really in my reading life, I'm always reading a lot of things about natural history, and I would just get a little tidbit about where this animal lived, where this animal lived, because I didn't want that book to just be all the usual suspects, all the animals that we normally think of. I wanted there to be some very interesting examples too. So there's there are crabs that live in tree holes. There are iguanas that live in tree holes. There are tree frogs that live in tree holes. And also information about how those tree holes are built, how they're erected, because some of them are created by, let's say, woodpeckers, but some of them are created by lightning. And some of them are created um, when a tree branch falls off a tree and then various de decomposers will make that hole larger and larger over time. So in order for me to look at kind of the whole diversity of tree holes and then pare it down to something that's very simple, um, it, it took a really long time. <laughs> um, Charnel, how long did you spend on your book? Let's see. <laughs> well, I'd say like from idea to publishing, uh, I don't know, maybe two and a half years. I feel like 2020 was kind of just a wormhole. So I'm like trying to remember when I started writing Rosetta. <laughs> I think it was like halfway through 2020 was when I started writing it. Um, and it took me maybe about nine months to get like a good like working manuscript um, to send to my editor. Um, and then uh, she helped me edit it some more, tweak some stuff. And then from there, I started the illustration. So I'm like, Rachel, like, I don't know how you were able to do both at the same time. I thought I'm not, I would be able to, but... I'm not counting since I had the idea. I, I was counting, like, like when did the project start on the calendar? Because if, if we're going to talk, when was it a twinkle in my eye? To, like, <laughs> we're going to include pitching. You know what I mean? Oh. Like, then, yeah. then that's a whole different time scale. Um, but... Uh, I, I can't write without the illustrating. So it's kind of like, yeah, and I, when I work, I do one book at a time. Like I don't, I, I mm -hmm. well, I, I like hyper-focus on that book to the point where like, I annoy everyone around me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it would be, I would be able to write and illustrate like at the same line, especially since because like I was an illustrator first um, and then an author, I was like, well, obviously, you know, pictures are going to come first. No, it did. That's <laughs> not how it works for me. <laughs> I had to write it first so that I could have a clear, you know, direction of where I wanted the illustrations to go. If, if you want to hear kind of like how weird I get with it, I, it's actually layout first. It's like me oh. in like Adobe Illustrator, Adobe InDesign setting the copy, putting down basic shapes. Mm -hmm. Where does the header go? It's like that level of like, like me thinking of it almost like a magazine <laughs> layout as I'm writing it. Oh, <laughs> getting the amount of like lorem ipsum, getting the amount of words <laughs> that will fit and then writing to that. Isn't it, oh. it's, it's, I work like weirdly backwards. It's like a puzzle. So cool. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's a puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> it is a puzzle. I, I like only worked on the most basic magazine layout, so that still feels like a puzzle to me. <laughs> um, I for... haven't had a chance to answer yet, I don't think. No, not yet, but um, I will answer now, though. Um, it took me like two years, I think. I was finished, like, at, different books take different amount of time, but I was finishing up my graphic novel at the time, um, which felt like a, a bunch of work, especially compared to um, a picture book, which was like, it was like my brain was like trying to figure out like how do I do this like after coming off of a graphic novel um and I tried to do the art and writing simultaneously and I couldn't and I had to like sit and do like okay this is the text and then once I had the text then I went to okay this is the layout 
Like how, how is it going to spread out across the pages? And then when I knew what text would be on the pages, then I did layouts to those page to the, the text, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. <laughs> the graphic designers are having like a... <laughs> It's just so layout is so important and yeah. like just like graphic design solidarity of the like <laughs> like figuring out the CMYK printing doing the layout yeah. oh my gosh <laughs> CMYK I, it, I call it color math <laughs> so like, when you're like trying to figure out the colors from like what you see on screen to how it prints oh, without the backlighting oh my gosh it's so different <laughs> so different and then like every printer is different and then you have to like like it's like okay now I have to put like more magenta and everything yeah the whole thing um well do you think we have time for one more question to wrap it up this will be more general so um the last question I'm going to ask is um what is the role of natural curiosity for you in your bookmaking process can you define natural curiosity yeah, natural curiosity, just like your inborn embedded curiosity. How does that play a role for you as a writer or an, and or an illustrator? I, I mean, I, I, oh, here, you want to go first? Go I was just going to say, I think for me, my insatiable natural curiosity is the reason that I write nonfiction instead of fiction. I, I mean, I think I, some writers, they love to invent worlds, they love to create their own characters. But for me, the natural world is so amazing that I just want to learn as much as I can about it and share it with other people. And so that's why I write nonfiction and I approach nonfiction. I approach everything I do with curiosity. And it's one of the reasons that we were saying before that one book often leads to another. My curiosity is the reason why, because I am going down rabbit holes during my research process and saying, oh, no, I can't include this in this book. But Maybe it's the beginning of a whole different book. So it, I think it propels me through the whole process every day. A great answer. <laughs> and I think like even to build off of that, you know, I always get these questions about work-life balance, mm -hmm. but to be perfectly honest, this is a lifestyle. Do you know what I mean? Especially yes. when you write nonfiction, yes. there is no separation between work and play and exploration you know like what do you do to relax the things that other people do to relax that will become my research and you get inspiration when you're least expecting it so playing is such a big part of what we do in our research process um, you know, if you're talking about the natural world, of course, you're going on hikes, you're visiting museums. If you're talking about someone like a historic figure, you're, you know, you're, you're going to the, like, say if you're researching Georgia O'Keeffe, you're going to the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. <laughs> you're, you're, you're checking everything out. You're reading her books. You're experiencing it as much as you can in first person. So, cause something will hit you that you don't, that you're not just going to get from reading in your room. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's like, it's kind of like, well, like, what do you do to relax? You go to museums, you go on hikes. Like, that's what you do for fun anyway. So it's kind of like um, a play is such a big part of the creative process that there is there there is no such thing. It's this flux between work and play that you're constantly doing to stay creative. And that's how little kids learn, mm -hmm. just by going out into the world and finding something that piques their curiosity and saying, I want to do that now. I'm a big believer in adult field trips of like, <laughs> oh yeah, I, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm kind of curious. So like what what field trips um, did you guys go on to research the people in your book? Oh, I have one. Um, Jackie's <laughs> from this place called Monagalia, PA. And I and then like was later in Pittsburgh. Um, and I, I went to Pittsburgh to visit my brother-in-law and his roommate was from Monagalia and I was hearing all about it. And I was like, wow. And all like all the hills and stuff. And I was just like walking around. And I was like, okay, so this is like, it was fun. <laughs> Pittsburgh was cool. <laughs> yeah. And then for me, um, I was on actually a birthday trip in Nashville um, when I was, you know, doing this book. And there is this museum, you know, on the main strip. I forget the name of it. I think it's like the Rock and Roll Museum, or I can't remember this, but it's like one of the, like the big, you know, uh, museums where they talk about all the musicians and stuff. 
And it was unexpected. I wasn't planning on it, but they have like this whole section on Rosetta Tharp. And I was like, yes, this is perfect. So I started like taking pictures of everything and like dotting down notes. So that was really great. Um, this has been just a delightful conversation, but we are at the end of our hour. So I'm going to have to wrap it up here. Um, thank you so much for your generosity and your responses today. This has been really wonderful. Um, tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's video recording, title list, and a certificate of completion. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline/webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. Calling all educators, school librarians, and media specialists, especially those working with students in the K through eight sphere, we need your feedback. Please fill out our educator survey to help us gauge how we can tailor Booklist's educational products to better serve your needs as a community. Recently, ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom reported 1,269 demands to censor library books and resources in 2022, the highest number of attempted book bans since ALA began compiling data about censorship in libraries more than 20 years ago. Join the Unite Against Book Bans campaign to help protect the freedom to read and to empower readers everywhere in discovery. Visit uniteagainstbookbans.org for more information, resources to donate, and more. And remember to vote in your local elections. And remember that you can utilize Booklist to support your library's collection development choices with reviews backed by the ALA. We have a special webinar subscription offer, and don't forget that your subscription dollars help ALA advocates on behalf of libraries, assisting those facing an unprecedented number of challenges. Email us at info at booklistonline.com for more information. Thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. One more huge, giant, enthusiastic thank you to our author panelists and to our sponsor, Random House Children's Books. This concludes today's webinar. See you next time.